show today was brought to you by Vitaplur E-Boost Gum. With no pill to take or powders to mix, Vitaplur E-Boost Gum is a first of its kind energy rave supplement that provides magnesium, electrolytes, and antioxidants while you chew. Vitaplur is the perfect complement to my active lifestyle. Whether it's at the festival, on the road touring, or hitting the gym, chew Vitaplur and dance with confidence. Use code Lizzie Jane for 10% off any order. This venue just looks crazy. Um, this venue is is crazy. You're you're in Denver, you're here to like see the best of the best. This is like the venue right before Red Rocks. I know it's usually it's interesting because it's like whenever a venue has ballroom in it, like for yeah. me, I always like because all the other ballrooms I've played have been like super kind of like band focused, like live room. Mm-hmm. So then I'm like, oh, I'm playing a ballroom. Like I, I prefer like a nightclub kind of experience, like for the kind of music I do. And then I did some research on the mission. I was like, oh, this shit is going to be This is it. Crazy. Yeah. I played Can your... I curse, by the way? Or no? Oh, okay. You're, okay. oh, you're good. You're I, I don't know. You're good. Sponsors, no. but I don't know. No, 100% good. can curse. 100%. Um, I played here with Excision last month. Wow. And that must have been crazy. Yeah, it's just crazy. But then, like, we also came and saw FKJ here. I've seen, like, I'm about to see 100 decks here. Like, you get people from all over. And yeah. they've, like, little fun fact is they've actually sonically replicated the sound like row by row from red rocks in here wow. like a shakespearean style like venues so like all the acoustics are kind of i guess it's the same company that does right? yeah AG? yeah yeah i mean i think it's like so cool when a city gets a venue like this because it's just so good for the culture like i remember i i you know, lived in new york my whole life and like before the brooklyn mirage like brooklyn mirage has been there for a while but like before it like kind of like got taken over and they like really started having like lots of artists there. You know, there's like clubs and stuff you can go to, but like once the Brooklyn Mirage kind of became what it was, it just like changed like the whole like nightlife dynamic. And it was just like something that like people it like united people and like and, and I feel like the same vibe. I'm not gonna compare this to the Brooklyn Mirage, very different experiences, mm-hmm. but um it kind of it feels like it has that some similarity there, right? Where where the production is like super good, you get like really, you know, amazing artists, like ones that fill out big rooms. So I think it's a huge win for the city. A hundred percent. And I feel like New York and Denver kind of have these very huge differences, but very similar like niches as far as, you know, having like an analogy of like how cultivated the music scene is and how cultural it is and the underground versus the mainstream and the commercial. And would you say Brooklyn Mirage kind of has that same you know, sense of community that it had when it opened as it does now, because I've heard from my end that yeah. it's becoming quite the destination spot. So it, any show selling out within five minutes, within seven minutes. So like, is that hard ticket value? Does it mean what it used to? I, I can kind of speak on it, but it's interesting for me. Cause it's like, I, when I go, I'm obviously when I'm not playing, I'm going as like a fan, but yeah. like the experience that I have, it's totally different. Cause like, I'm going with like a guest list spot, like backstage, like I'm not in the crowd, but yes, like that is one. Um, it's just, there's, there's such a high demand. that it, it gets very packed in there. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, I think they used to do a lot more like underground house and techno. Like that's how it started. There was this party called like city Fox and it was like more about like, and city Fox still happens actually. It's like owned by, it's like a party. They do only at the Brooklyn Mirage. Okay. It's usually a lot of like European, like house and techno artists that come. And I think the venue was like started by some Swedish guy that owns City Fox. Uh, and yeah, like there, there's definitely a community. Like you can go on like TikTok and you'll see like, you know, accounts that are just like Brooklyn Mirage memes pretty much, you know. So it's like there is that like kind of bringing people together from all walks of life in, in New York um, for music. But it is, I mean, it's such an experience there. It's almost like a festival, like for every show, like a one day festival. So like obviously people are going to come from out of town. Um and yeah, I, I don't really know if, if that makes the experience better or worse. I will say that they've the the production has been crazy in the last year. Have you seen mm-hmm. like the LED wall? Yeah, stuff? oh yeah. Like you can't really I don't know any other place in America that you can get that experience. So it's like mm-hmm. maybe with like some, you know, there are some disadvantages of like it being so popular that it's like a these, space kind of. Yeah, you yeah. know. Um I think same thing as like club space, club club space in Miami. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it, it once it kind of blows up on social media, it's like people are going to want to come and it's going to probably change the experience for the locals. But that's just like everything that. You yeah. Know. 
it's it's always comes with like a good and a bad kind of like with like tech house in itself blowing up to be like what it is now i know you've always kind of like really stayed in your own lane honed your own craft like with the west end project there's definitely i would say like in my opinion not being like a tech house extraordinaire like there is like a sound attached to it um i would like love to know kind of the progression of the West End project. Like, did you go to school? Like, did you study <coughs> music? Like, how did this lifestyle come about? Yes. Yeah, so I got into electronic music when I was in high school. Um, I kind of like the first artist I just, it was like during the blog house era. So okay, yeah. the artist I was like really in love with, like, I remember the first album I was like obsessed with, obsessed with was uh, Justice's Cross album. I still love them. I'm actually going to open up tonight with a, uh, edit i did of uh genesis which is like one of my favorite songs like from the album justice it's, it's gonna bang yeah. i'm telling you right now yeah. it's gonna bang yeah 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 yeah. so like that's kind of like when i got into like electronic music and like stopped listening i don't even know what i listened to before that it was like kind of like hip-hop and like pop and and rock um like indie rock kind of stuff and yeah i started to like go to a couple shows in new york um hard was a company at the time mm-hmm. before it was owned by insomniac was owned by destructo and they would do these parties at Terminal 5. So we would, you know, kind of try to get in on these 18 plus parties with like fake IDs. And um, I remember I saw Gustavo Steen's like first US performance, like Dylan Francis, like Diplo, like that. Those are like the artists I really loved when I first got into electronic music. So, um, and I actually started producing in high school because the guy who invented, like pre- pretty much invented the synthesizer once in my high school, Moog, like your oh, Moog synthesizer. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, it's super random. Uh, the high school I went to is actually like, uh, it's like, it's a it's a public school in New York. Is it York. like an artsy school kind of? No, not really. No? It's, like, okay. it's actually like a science school. It's called Bronx High School of Science. There's a lot of like big alumni that went there, like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. We, we've got more Nobel Prize winners than the country of Spain. Incredibly in intelligent. The, yeah, it's like it, a lot of smart kids, you have to like, take a test to get in. And the only way you get in is if uh, uh, my tour manager, Kyle, also went to high school with me. That's why I'm laughing. Love it. Love um, it. But, yeah, if you score above a certain grade, a uh, uh, certain score on this test, you get in. So it didn't matter if, like, you didn't do any homework and you were, like, a terrible, like, student. It's like if you were just, like, Based on real knowledge. It was just on, like, this one test and intelligence. So, like, if you mm-hmm. did really bad at the test, you couldn't go to these, like, high schools. It was, it's a very debated way of, like, getting into high school. But anyways... Yeah, so it's like a very sciencey tech kind of school. But there was a class called Digital Music Lab where it was like a bunch of computers and uh, MIDI keyboards. And you would essentially, yeah, just like learn how to make music. It wasn't like electronic music. It was just like music on the computer. Yeah. So that's kind of where I fell in love with production. And at the same time, I kind of got into DJing. We would DJ. I, me and this other guy, uh, guy, Che, we would DJ these parties around for all the kids in our high school. So we mm-hmm. go to like find little venues around in the city, rent them out, throw a little rager, play like progressive. Only house. in New York. Only in New York. LA. There was no house party. So it was like, we had to find these venues. So that's kind of where I fell in love with like DJing. And I l- fell in love with production at the same time. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is going to be my thing. I'm going to be like the DJ kid and like the producer kid. And let's like, see how like where this goes. Um, and I, yeah, I did it throughout college. And I, I went to school in the South. I went to Duke. Um, electronic music wasn't like very big there but i was able to play some stuff uh, another artist that was in my grade at duke was spencer brown I don't know oh, okay spencer. yeah he makes like progressive house yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i've seen his um, name right? and he actually used to make dubstep uh, oh, that's he, he, yeah same name uh, it was called spencer that's when i <laughs> so when i first met him from dallas he, he has like uh collabs with like rusco and sh- stuff oh day, so like, like way old, back kind of like this 140 yeah. yeah this is like like, he was, like, out of Texas with AFK. They were, like, doing stuff. Okay. AFK actually lives here. <coughs> oh. Fucking. All the dubstep even, artists had an open door. I don't even so. know if I should say this, but Getter just fucking moved here. So, like, there. And this I think you didn't let anybody the, know. The Mecca. But yeah, it's definitely the Mecca. Like, you walk into clubs here, like, at mission shows, and, like, you upstairs, and it's not like, oh, you know, some people kind of maybe recognize me and da-da-da. It's You're like, looking around, and it's, like, all of these national oh, touring acts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New York's kind of like that, too, I would say, for, like, house music. You know, it's, like, mm-hmm. similar thing. We were, we were at dinner before and, like, saw a bunch of people with, like, like Wakan jerseys. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the pins on the hats They rep stuff. it all the time. They, they rep it hard. Yeah. I will say the bass, bass fans are way better at mer- at wearing artists, their, like, favorite artist merch than house. 
house fans definitely the merch scene is like for whatever reason it's getting better but it's just like it was never a big thing i mean to me i feel like merch is one of the highest returns for like lowest spends like lowest amount of expenses exactly i come from like the band life and like when you're like i was in like a post hardcore band like through high school through college and like that's how you make the majority of your money is yeah. pushing merch and pushing t-shirts and just so many creative things. And if you look at like, you're so right. Cause I feel like I'm not super clued in, but compared to like <coughs> Elenium or excisions merch rollout and the whole team they have behind it and Zed's dead and dead beats and altered States. So much merchandise is pushed. It's like a whole other like brand. And I think yes. they're really good at making like a lifestyle brand too. So it's not just like, Oh, the like the artist logo, logo or whatever. The chest, yeah. It's like everyone kind of has like their own style, and like I, I take a lot of inf inspiration for that as well. Because like I'm gonna be doing a lot more merch this year, and it's like the bass guys just have it totally knocked down mm -hmm. with the uh, with merch. But yeah, I don't know. I think like house, it's like a lot of times house fans. I don't want to say bass fans aren't like this, but like it's more you're a fan of like house and the sound. And it's less like the actual culture instead of like an individual like yeah idol. exactly and it's like and I think also just like house artists don't make as much merch and so it's kind of like a circular issue where it's like well there's not as much cool stuff so there's not as much to buy but I, I think we're gonna see a big change with that because I you know uh, someone who does merch really well is this guy Clooney okay um, he does like yeah he, he's got a label called Hellbent and they do merch and it's super fucking sick that's how i feel like i see like house acts flourish is through their labels yeah. merchandise. because if i think of like i don't know the one that just comes to mind just because it's like the most commercialized one well no it's uh like green green velvet's label you have relief records you have dirty <coughs> bird like all of that like when i think of the dirty artist i think really of their well. labels merch if i'm thinking of something visually yeah i think it's i think it has to do with the fact that like house artists they don't brand the same way that bass artists do mm -hmm. visually as much. It's more, I won't say it's more about the music, but it's less, there's less of like a visual no, it component. Is. You can absolutely say that. Yeah. But I, but I do believe that it's a little bit more about the music and like the visual component comes secondary. And like, that's why I think bass artists like kill it on visuals for a show because so mm -hmm. much of like the experience is like that kind of like hard ticket experience where you're going to get a custom show and there's like a whole brand to it. Like, Res has like a very specific brand mm -hmm. and then like the merch kind of works with that. Subtronics has like a very specific brand, trippy kind of, you know, and it, it works well into the merch. So I think when you don't have that with the artists as much in house, there's obviously exceptions. Um, when they start a label, that's where they can get a more of a visual identity. And so then that's where I, I think you see more of like the merch that kind of matches that absolutely and i think when a project within like the more experimental bass realm gets to that point where the music's there half the time the music isn't there yet but let's say it's there then it's like okay when i say your name if i'm not going to associate it with you and how you look what am i going to associate it with what's that yeah. visual representation literally just like you're on like a business on shark tank going to pitch like what's your like what's your marketing ploy like where is like the sellability in all of this and like for Super me to boring. like attach myself to something because when you go to a res show see all the fucking glasses out there you know and you know excision show all of the x's and the jerseys yeah. and all that shit and i don't know it's it's a very crazy thing how kind of all of these different subgenres and electronic music definitely like cross paths in like this venn diagram ish way but they're so different they're very different the way you consume it is extremely different mm -hmm. um the spaces you play in are often like very different but i think that's why festivals are so fun because it's like the place where like you get so many genres at once yeah. um and you can kind of like you know it's, 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 it's i see it on tiktok all the time it's like the bass fans the house heads you know mm -hmm. it's like i i kind of like it it's like there's like rivalries and stuff between it's everyone. Like the lunch table. People are like school. talk about like it's like almost like a religion. Like I converted yeah. from I used to be a bass head <laughs> and now I'm a techno cult. snob. And it's like I think that happens just, as you get older. Maybe it's just a, an analogy for society. Maybe it's like it's like the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians. You guys. Well, it's like for <laughs> instance, like <laughs> like EDM Twitter. Canceled. You know, yeah. Can <laughs> canceled. canceled. Literally canceled. Um, it it's <clears> really <throat> interesting because a lot of people are like, oh. You know, this is only in music and this is only here. I think it happens in every industry. Oh, I think you have sure. those pockets in engineering and you have those pockets in the medical field. And, you know, it's it's just this 
thing of where society is at and how social media is just like people boiled like to, to categorize the top. themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And I mean, speaking of like you playing festivals, I feel like you know any project takes at least close to 10 years to start popping off i think that's like the number that's ingrained in the sand i think it's getting smaller but yeah. I, I do agree would you attest that like to tiktok and to like various oh. forms of social media i mean it's just it's just crazy like you can go you can like start making music like make music like learn how to make music like a year or two ago and then you know have some stuff going for you have like one video blow up and like your 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 life is forever changed. Like that used to not be the case. You had to kind of go through the ropes as much. But I mean, I still think it's rare for like that. But is that happen. like longevity for the majority? I feel like that happens definitely for a very small percentile. I mean, we've all seen people come into our space that were no one. Yeah. That were that were literally like see you in eight years when you actually know how to make music. And then yeah. all of a sudden they're doing the edits and the bootlegs and the mashups and they're getting millions of plays. And then a record company or an agency comes to the table and they're like, hey, well, we can probably do some favors for you. I think it's like, it's, it's something I think about a lot. And I think this discussion like has like recently been happening a mm -hmm. lot as well on on the internet, uh, especially on Twitter. I think yeah. like it's, it's, it's easy to think of like time put in as an artist to like value or like the, the concept of like deserving certain things I think is like very interesting. And like, I think there's a lot of uh, views on it that are just like, I won't say like problematic, but like aren't kind of like realistic with like how things work. And like once I kind of like, cause like I, I used to think like sometimes like, Oh, certain people don't deserve certain things based on like either their, what my perceived that like, it's all perception. Like my perception of their skill or like, yeah. you know, time put into something. But, you know, it really is like, it's kind of just like a market and it's, it really is just like supply and demand and people have demand for many different reasons. And it's not just like, you know, I could be like, wow, I don't, I don't understand anything in this music, but there's something there that, you know, people like. And so I've kind of like stopped viewing things in like certain ways related to that. And I, I'm more of just like, people kind of get their value. If there's value there, it's, it's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, either that person like can sell tickets or people think they'll sell tickets or, um, you know, there's some potential in the project. It is like the unfortunate kind of reality in the space is that like the, the opportunities and like the gatekeepers, like money is such a big thing it there. Is. Yeah. Um, so I think like there's like often a divide in like the community where it's like for the culture, that isn't really what people want. But at the same time, that is like kind of like how the business operates. Um, and it's just it's a very interesting topic. I think it comes up all the time. Like it most does. things get, can, can get boiled down to that. But I don't know. It's just super interesting. It's such about. an interesting conversation. And like the market will always have like ebbs and flows. And it's like just as like your career, like your career will always exactly. have a shelf life. And it's just sometimes you'll be hot. Sometimes you won't. Be, exactly. You know I mean? And there's some people who have a goal to shoot right up, stay there for five years and then they're done. They want to go on to something else. And then there's people who have goals to, I want to, you know, build this house of bricks and it's going to take a long time and I'm going to make a bunch of different types of fucking music, but then I'm going to blow up like Fred again or blow up like Fortet. And it's going to be like, all of these years of work and it's like what I wanted and the vision I wanted. And there's always going to be gives and takes. There's always going to be sacrifices, yeah. but it, it really is all perception. But the way that I've always looked at it is like, if there's consumers, there willing to throw money at it. then there's business people on the other side that, one that one are willing to monetize it. it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's difficult. I, I think like for no artists, like I, I think it's very, very difficult to like, um, create like a hit or like to make an artist like super popular like i think when those like crazy moments do happen it's like totally random almost yeah um like fred again is someone who's been like, involved with music for like a really long time and it's like starts this project and kind of like you know extremely talented and like everything aligns and um internet you know takes a hold of it and <laughs> yeah and boom like forte has been around for like 20 i don't, I don't know how long he's been it's around like her dad's like, age 25 years or something like that um carl cox has gotten like in and out of style like yeah multiple times so it's like for i, I can only really speak for myself as an artist but like for me it's like i want to be doing this for the rest of my life so it's like what can i be doing to 
kind of like put myself in a situation where I can be doing this for the rest of my life. And it's not always just like, oh, like you're really hot right now. Like that doesn't last forever. And it's not realistic to think that's going to last forever. So it's like, how do I, you know, set myself up in a way so that like I don't, you know, I don't have to worry about that. I mean, I I think after COVID, hopefully every touring act got a really big slap in the face that touring is not financial stability. And you have to like, the one thing that like, I have just such a problem with sometimes is people who I would say, you know, there's always different journeys. There's always going to be people who are ghost producers. There's always going to be ghost producers. There's always going to be people who do it all. And if you have taken the time to hone your craft and you have the skill set that a producer, in my opinion, should have, whether it's you're just composing or you're just a mix engineer, you're just a master engineer, the amount of money you can make with that skill set or even more so turning that skill set into a monetized business, knowing branding, knowing all the shit that we sit in our four walls and have to think and come up with and have calls with other individuals with, like you can wear a multitude of different hats, whether that means you go and be a sound designer for Pixar or you have a Patreon and you do lessons and you like your discord and all that stuff, like any way that you can monetize things that you're passionate about, things that you're good at, things that you put the skill and time into, like the better, you know? Yeah, I think I think there's like this view. I, I used to think of it as well. Where it's like you are just like you as an artist and like every all the skills you've learned, it's like they only go into like your sessions yeah. where you're writing your, you know, songs that you're going to like potentially release or play out and like you're DJing. It's the same way. I think with DJing, it's a little different because it's like, I mean, obviously you can like teach people how to DJ, but it's like, you know, you can't ghost DJ. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. On, on, it's like you you're under the decks. Before, it's like, you can DJ, it's, like the, it's like the Wizard of Oz is like under the decks with like a curtain and they yeah. they're like doing the mixing and it's like moving it but uh, yeah. um no yeah it, so like i think the pandemic was like a huge wake up because i was like i couldn't play shows um i actually wasn't even making like enough money to really live like before that playing shows anyway i was like living at home with my parents because i was like i really want to make this happen like let me just be as like frugal as possible yeah. and like try to make this happen i was in a very similar situation and then covid came and then like I lost the shows that I was going under on anyways. And yeah. I was like, oh, so you're well, actually this like is making time. money. Yeah, yeah like, this is time. Like, this wow. is a good time to do this. I don't have to buy all these fights in hotel rooms and, yeah. and lose all this money. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like I think once, you know, and like I think for some people it doesn't make sense. Like some people just want to be artists. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then you just have to accept the fact that if like you, you know, maybe you're gonna have like another job while you you work as an artist or a lot of people um, do for a long time. Yeah, a ton of people do. Like I remember Jay Wara was like working a corporate job until like a few months ago or Blossom something like that. Was, like, like there were a lot of people like until crazy they... hustling. And I was just like, how do you do that? Cause like for me, it was like I ended up quitting like my job in 2018, like midway through or end of 2018. What did you do um, before? I worked at like a tech company in New York. Okay. So after graduate school, like I yeah, worked at a tech company. Didn't really make that much money, especially like living in New York. It was like mm, not that much, but um, it was like it was a good job to make music um, and like travel a bit because it was like tech is like kind of chill. Like, yeah, like Monday to Friday. Get, yeah, it's like pizza and beer, Super Smash Bros. during the day. Like, <laughs> I went, yeah, I definitely took advantage of it a little bit. Um, uh, what were we talking about? You like. Getting, you know, you're good. Like Patreon, oh yeah, like Discord, exactly. like wearing yeah, multiple yeah. hats. COVID, going into COVID. Yeah, totally, totally back on track now. So great. Yeah, so COVID ended everything, and I started doing music production lessons. Um, because someone actually just messaged me, and they're like, "Would you do like the like a Zoom lesson with me?" Yeah. Because I think some other people were doing it, and I was like, "Sure," but like I've never done that, and like. I was very, I had like a ton of like imposter syndrome on like whether I was qualified. You're like, do I know enough? Yeah, I was like, do, am I, I'm not like a teacher. Like, can I actually like talk on these things? Um, But like, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed teaching people what Mm -hmm. I knew about music and like seeing, and it would stress me out before every lesson because I would literally try to make sure like they would send me stuff that like questions I could prepare answers to. Yeah. Um, I was like, I was so concerned with like the customer getting value out of it yeah um which was like good and bad it was like good for the customers and like i would get a lot of repeat customers because like i put a lot of effort into these like sessions but it was like stressed me out a ton 
Um, I'm still teaching the kids that I started with during I mean, COVID. I, I, I kind of miss it, to be, to be honest. Like, that's kind of how I got into, like, doing YouTube tutorials because it's, like, mm-hmm. it gives you a way to, like, still – impound wisdom on people but like to the masses to the masses and it's like it's kind of like passive right like it once you do the video it just lives up there and people can like watch it that's why things like patreon and um patreon literally saved me i still do patreon but you did the same thing with your discord yeah so we we came up to the idea to create like a discord community where it's like as a member you get access to tutorials you get access Mm -hmm. to feedback from like all these coaches um, who are also producers. And I think big thing for me was like, especially when you looked at the YouTube space um, for teaching electronic music, a lot of the people that have like really popular channels, they aren't really like touring acts. Mm-hmm. Like some are, but like some aren't. And I don't think that you have to be a touring act to um, know how to make electronic music some at all. Some people don't want to tour. Of course, some people like, don't want to tour and they're like probably better than I people that do tour. Yeah. But I did think that like there is like a market for people that want to learn from like the artists that they listen to yes. in that space. And there is a credibility. You can monetize. And you did it. Like I see you doing it. Kind exactly. Of and yeah. like they, I do think that those people are a little bit more in tune, especially like DJs with like what's hot and like, what are the yes. sounds that people actually want to know how to make versus like being reactive and then making those tutorials later. It's like, mm-hmm. let's like think this is what is getting popular. This sound is like kind of bubbling now. We want to teach people how to do it before it's too late because yeah. i think if you the traditional means or it's a little late on that kind of stuff usually if you're following a trend by the time you master it it's on to the next one i i think about this all the time it's like especially in tech in tech house like you know the sounds of fisher for example were very popular yep you know he kind of started blowing up in like 2018 2019 those like plucks and like stabs and, yeah the super yeah. saws on the drops and stuff and then it took like two or three years for the people that like were inspired to want to make music from that sound mm-hmm. to actually get good enough where like their mixes and like they could make a sound that like DJs would want to play. It took two or three years, but by that time it's over, that sound is not, it's kind of lost itself a little bit. As I do with Fisher, it was just like that old kind of sound yeah. um, isn't as popular. And so when people hear that, it's like, it's still like usable, but like it's not the stuff that I see getting signed to those like really cool labels or like well, Charlie number one on before. It becomes the why you <coughs> conversation. Why am I going to take a chance on you as an up and coming act that's yeah. making something that sounds exactly like Fisher, yeah. who I know if I crank out the extra cash to bring him in, I've got five sold out nights in a row at X amount of dollars. Or it's like you won't get like, it's very hard to get like support because no one wants like the support to sound like the yeah. headliner. It's like you want someone like kind of cooler or whatever. And I think that sound, like, even if you listen, like, it's just people don't play it as much anymore. Yeah. They, like, you know, techno got really popular. People are looking at more of, like, it's kind of, like, progressive, melodic techno sounds coming back. Um, I wish they did that in bass music, though, because I feel like a lot of times, like, support acts in bass music. I mean, just like house music, there's so many different subgenres yeah. in house music. There's so many different subgenres in bass music. Of course, yeah. But you really will go to a show with with five openers that sound exactly the fucking same. Yeah. Well, that's on the promoter, And that's right? difficult. It's difficult. But if it's part of a very large tour, it's like, you know, whether <coughs> they're kind of, I would say like cane staging the actual support acts as far as like production and sound and this and that. I think that's a really different take that doesn't happen often unless you have a promoter that really is cultured and has really good taste and like education on how to like present a night properly where I feel like if you hear, if I hear five hours of tech house and the headliner comes on, I'm ready to shoot myself. So like I have to like have a variation and that's where I feel like the visual aspect in house music. I mean, I want a dark room. I want very subtle, detailed you know, a lighting designer that really knows the cues and knows when to have their accent marks and maybe even no LEDs, maybe even just a logo. I feel like that is way more widely accepted where if that happens in bass music, it's like, okay, are you like not investing into your project kind of thing? It's it's definitely a totally different experience. Um, I think just like the way the music is and like the way the sets are planned. Like, I don't, I don't, I haven't been to a bass show in a while, but like, I feel like the shets, sets are a little bit shorter. And so you yes. have a lot more, uh, support acts and so it's harder to you know especially with like house music like usually when I go to play a club 
it'll be one or two openers before me and maybe they have like an hour and a half two hour set a journey and usually it's like and then probably not like a closer maybe maybe sometimes like a closer after um but like a lot of times like the the, the artists opening in house they could just be djs they're not producers as well so they don't have like a sound that they need to push and they can be more flexible with how they what songs they decide to play mm-hmm. what the mood is you know that's a lot of bad openers like people that just want to rip out the bangers because they want that's it to difficult. be their moment. Um, Where in bass, I feel like it's more accepted. You can get up there and just slam. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's definitely not. It's, I mean, it, it is somewhat accepted. It, it kind of depends. Um, it depends on like, you know, if you're being, yeah, I, I don't like to publicly be just like, this is the way to do it. This is not the way to do it because yeah. it's like, I have been in that position too, where it's like, you want to do what you want to do. Yes. And if you're being booked for something, you should feel like you have the freedom to do it, you know, what you want, but just know that there's like consequences to how you perform, right? Like you may not get asked to be back, even though if you think you did like an amazing job or, you know, you, everyone was happy, but like the headliner wasn't happy because you slammed it out and you gave him, you gave, you didn't give him like a chance to like build the room. It's like you already gave it the song over to him at like a super high energy. So I think there's, it's a very complicated topic. It's one that also mm-hmm. comes up, I feel like on, EDM Twitter a ton. And, oh, yeah. Gotta and love EDM Twitter. I know. It's like, it's just like a cycle. Like the same same topics and the just like different examples come up every once in a while. You kind of get spicy on Twitter sometimes. I feel like I've that seen... You're supposed to get spicy. I, I know, and I hate it. That's the, it's that's literally the like... If the, you're not controversial, then it's boring as fuck because you're it just It really... Like, it's so boring. You have to... That, there's, a, there's a law. I forget what, who's named after, but it's basically that if you say... The quickest way to get like a response on the internet is like say the wrong thing or 100%. or people just love to correct anyone on the internet they so. love to go off people exactly. right now just want to go off on whatever it is and it, it's just hard because you're <coughs> trying to you know promote something you spent countless hours and days yeah. and money and time on and then there's something going off on twitter if you don't fit in that pocket whether it's the DJ versus producer or it's you know the this girl liner, using samples whatever, whatever if you don't fit into it it you're not gonna get that exposure. It's and like it's like gossip, you know. It's like there's a gossip going on, and like the algorithm is gonna reward that yep. talking about that because like everyone's talking about it. So you kind of like you know, it's a good time to like say something if you want to get you know. Elon loves controversy. Yeah, exactly. He just loves it. He uh, encourages it. 100%. So it, it is a good platform for that. I don't think I'm particularly good at it, but like I do. I, I'm a New Yorker. I kind of know how to like push people's buttons and stuff. And how, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I know what topics are going to be controversial, but a lot of times it's like, these are also like, that's generally like how I, I, I think in a situation. So I'm very much like, if this is what I think. I'm not, you know, I'm going to put it out there. And it's still such a small percent of actual consumers. So it really is like a little tiny pocket of people exactly. who just want to partake like, in the actual Twitter experience. And it is by far the best way to get like an actual response from your favorite artist that I do think is yeah, like you cut down that tool. fourth wall and like because you can send DMs on Instagram or on Facebook but like we can open them we don't have to respond yeah. whereas on Twitter it's kind of like that's this is easy kind of thing like oh I can respond to you um, I, never, I never thought about that that's a really good point it's like it's like pure it's like what is the message like here it is and it's not like nosy or like intrusive to do it it's not yes. like you're in like their DMs like doing this you're it's like, like on a public it's, like, it's like a public forum exactly so yeah, that, that is really smart. I, like, I'm going to start telling, like, you know, asking people for, like, promo emails or things like that. It's like, you know, they may have, like, locked DMs, but it's like if you want to, like, mm-hmm. somehow get in contact with your favorite artist, Twitter's probably the place to do it. 100%. Oh, my God. Absolutely. That, that or, like, I used to, like, when I first started doing the podcast, mostly SoundCloud, when artists get really big, like, the last generation artists, like, the Adventure Clubs and those guys, mm. they all still have their information on SoundCloud. That's the, that's so, the place to go to. So Eight, it's all there. Whenever people ask, like, book a show and stuff, it's like, I don't know why, but, like, SoundCloud is, like, managers, agents, yep, whatever else you got going on, right your bio there. and stuff. Um, so have you, like, always been a New Yorker? You live in New York now. You were raised in New York. Went to high school in New York. Went to, went to college, not in New York, but then came back yeah. to New York. That was that was pretty much the college years were the only time I've not lived in my, New York my whole life. Where's Duke again? It's in North Carolina. Like yeah, Ra- I mean, I would want to go back to Durham? New York, too. Yeah. No, no. no. Even the Raleigh? Yes. Raleigh's it's, cool. No, not New cool. York. It's, it's definitely not. It, <laughs> yeah. Durham and Raleigh and then um, where UNC is, it's called Chapel Hill. Yeah, like I've been the, there. It's called the Research Triangle. It's like 
three kind of cities all um, connected. So like that's the, the, the closest. All I know about there. Duke is good, good school, good basketball team. Yeah, we just lost today. Oh, really? In the, there you in the go. Tournament. Are you a big sports person? No, I'm not a big sports person, but um, yeah, I, I literally hadn't watched one Duke game this whole year. I'm like the worst Duke fan. Did you feel like your like collegiate experience was like cool? I'm glad I'm here and trying this normal life, but it's like not for me. Mm, kind of. I mean, I I had no idea that I would ever, ever be able to DJ full time. Like I. I, w- I wouldn't say I was like skeptical of it, but I was like in no way like convinced that that was going to be my life. I was mm-hmm. like, it would be sick to work in music somehow. Like I remember I like wanted to work at Splice when I was at um, working at this tech company because I was like, oh, I'm already in tech. Like I can work at this music tech company that I used to make my productions and I can still do like my DJ stuff on the side. And like I'll be in like a little more in the industry because I get to do this. So I actually had no idea that I was going to be able to pursue this as a full time thing. So it wasn't like my collegiate experience. I was like, oh, like I, you know, because like that's kind of like whatever my, my school did, you know, go to college and Duke is like where my mom went to school, my sister, my younger sister. Oh, okay, so you're a legacy Duke, there. yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a big Dukey, but yeah, I had no idea. Like I was very much like, oh, right, I'm gonna go to I'm college and get now. yeah, and like get a job and like do whatever. And it's stuff, a so. like very weird realization because I did the same thing. I went to GW for a year, okay, and but cool. then I was like, no, and tried it. Did sorority, did everything normal, and I was just like, holy shit! Like I'm cool with partying. I'm done with this. I was going to raves in DC every weekend, and I love the DC scene. Oh, like so. Echo Stage, U Street, like all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Like Rest first raves peace. ever. Doesn't I know. Exist I know. Um, that used to be like it would be like Soundcheck, U Street, Echo Soundcheck. Stage. Dude, I I think DC's got one of the best scenes on the East Coast for sure. Like, really? I, I always I've been like playing there. Like that was like one of the first places I used to go. Very eclectic space, obviously because it's DC. Yeah. Very all over international. Tons of different types of people. I like how like I like how like everyone knows each other in the, in the kind of scene over there. Um, I like the way they book acts, like the type of acts they book. Like it's a lot of like newer, smaller acts. Like they take risks on things. I, I really mm-hmm. like the spaces they have for artists. Like you have Echo Stage, which is like kind of like something like this. Yeah. It's like a the production and just like it's it. You know what you can do there. Soundcheck is like the same thing, but for like a smaller um, crowd, but. Yeah, I absolutely love DC. Like they were one of the first cities outside of New York that I would like travel to for a show. Yeah, and okay. Like, I, I have like that makes sense being in like there. the Northeast yeah, area. Like you kind of hit the places around. I'm you. taking the bus to DC a few yeah. times. I'll never do that again. But no, like, especially now, train. Uh, I probably won't do that again either. But <laughs> it's just a weird like thing when you realize, not necessarily like, oh, you don't have to grow up. It's just a similarity where you were in high school doing what you do now. And I think there's just, I don't know if it's social pressure or just the way that a lot of people's like lives kind of correlate or progress maybe because of like their parents going to a certain school or doing X, Y, and Z. But you feel like you have to like grow up. Like, oh, it's time to grow up. Like we're all going to college and then this happens and then we get our degrees and then maybe masters and then maybe we get married and have kids and da da da. And I feel like everybody in EDM is like, fuck that. We're just gonna like do our own thing. And it's cool to realize like, hey, if I put the same time that I put into my degree into something that I really love and enjoy, you can probably make business out of it. Yeah, I, I do think that like in any like creative, like artsy kind of space there, it's like, and I, I, th- I do think that actually is the reality of the situation is that like, it is extremely difficult to make money doing yes. your passion and what you love whether it's sports or arts anything. Or, or anything like anything. So for most people, it is like a lot safer to like not do that. But yeah. I think as like a young adult, if you're able to, that's the best time to pursue it because like you have like the least amount of things like holding you down, whether that is like a child, you know, that's like a lot of fucking Changes work or, yeah. or like um, you're just like older and you know, you can't take as much risk. So I think that was like a big thing for me was like, I was like, okay, I'm like, fresh out of college like if there's a time to like quit this job i'm doing and like really like go for this it's now and like it took a few years like and you know it could have taken a few more years like you know I, and i still would have done it because like once i kind of left i was like okay i really it's, it's funny it's like you you quit your nine to five and you end up working 24 hours a day because it's like it, it, when you love something it's like it never stops 
and the work, it can be more stressful, it can be less stressful, but it's so much more rewarding what I do. And I, I yes. can hopefully never have to go back to uh, working a corporate job. Um, I mean, I'll always say that like, if you put the same amount of work into your project as you did for a salary paying job, we'd all be millionaires. Yeah. So it's, it's the bills need to be paid. And yeah, you know, it's not, it's you not. have to find a happy medium. And, and I, I will always say like starting a project and starting a career and trying to grow it in like the music space is like doing a startup. It's like doing a business. Like you're not going to be profitable. You're going to go under, you have to have some sort of financial stability, whether it is a corporate job or whether it is a part-time job in your parents to fund house it, or whatever, or you'll is, go like under. Cause you have to find a way to break through and sustain yeah. yourself. I, I think, yeah, I, I think about this a lot as well. Cause I work with like, you know, so many um, students and, and stuff and kicking bass. And I, I've done all these lessons and, you know, the thing that the people are, are I've also just seen so many artists like go from like, just like local and really small artists to like the biggest artists in the world. Like I've literally seen like this happen and it all kind of just comes down to um, this like almost like no plan B attitude where you're like, I'm going to like fully commit myself to this. And it also comes down to the fact that these people like kind of get rid of things in their lives that could like hold them down, whether that's like a relationship that doesn't really like work for being like a, a touring artist or, um, you know, like the, the more things you have in your life that are making it difficult for you to do what you love, the, it's going to be impossible to like get to that level. You kind of have to be in a space where you're like, I don't have anything else that is going to like stop me from doing this. I'm going to do this. If you're worried about like your bills, if you have like a kid that you can't like travel away with, like those are all th- not saying it's like impossible, but those are all things that make it extremely difficult to become a full-time DJ producer artist thing. Cause it's like, it, it, it's just going to hold you down. So it is, the people yeah. that I see succeed, they, they kind of like free themselves up in a way. Um, and so that's why it's like so important to like keep that job. Cause it's like, if you can't like keep pay it bills, until you, you get fucking you fired. Exactly. You like know? you'll know when to stop. You'll you know. know, you'll know. Yeah, absolutely. So what's, uh, I could talk on that topic for an hour. And <laughs> of itself. course. Um, it's, there's just so many, so much of it is a mental game and a perspective game and where 100%. am I versus where I want to be and setting up the game plans and having the right team behind you. But it all comes with time. And I think everybody's journey is different. Everybody makes mistakes. They learn from them. It's going to happen to you. Even if you watch the person in front of you, it happens to them. Mistakes you know? are good. Mistakes, mistakes are great. I Failure make, is great. No is great. Exactly. I love like when things go wrong because it's like, I'm, you know, then you're like, okay. Yeah, you're like, in the moment, you're like, fuck. But you're then like, you oh, reflect. whatever. But then it's like, yeah. next, you go to sleep, wake up the next day, you're like, Okay, these things went wrong. Now I'm gonna make sure this never happens again. Yep. And it like one that culminates, and then that's what makes you like an extremely knowledgeable person just in life, right? Like when we say like older people have like really great like life experiences, it's just that. It's like fucking up enough times where it's like you know life. you know what you want and like what you need to do to get there. Hundred percent. So what is uh next for the West End project? You've been releasing like a ton of fucking singles. Um, is there like an EP on the way or is there like, I know you're all over right now. You're touring a ton. Are you going to be in Miami next week? Yeah, well, I'll be in Miami for Miami Music Week for sure. I don't think I've missed one in the last, like, other than when it didn't happen over COVID. But like, I, I've been going for like six or seven years. So yeah, we're doing a few shows in Miami. Um, and yeah, we have some more shows coming in the spring. I will be launching my label this year. Um, there's no name yet, but it's Love coming. It. <laughs> it'll come later this year. I'm really fucking excited to launch a label. It's you have to like, use something like New York theme too. Uh, it has to be like. Don't worry. We're. Okay. I can't okay. speak too much on it, but we're, we're doing, you know, we're coming up with the whole concept of it now. So that, that's been super fun. Um, I just uh, launched a new company called Scraps. Um, so it is a basically a marketplace for people to, uh, artists to sell their project files from their songs. Um, so not only like songs that they've like released on like Spotify and stuff, but like the stuff that's just like kind of sitting on the computer yeah. that you may have no use for. We kind of like me and uh, a team of these really amazing uh, college kids um, came, came up with this idea. And, you know, it, it the idea is that artists can sell these project files on scraps and people that are trying to learn how to make music can buy them to kind of like study the project files to see how like their favorite artist song was made to get inspired by that. it, um, to learn like new techniques. And it's like another, you know, hopefully this is going to be um, a major revenue stream for artists because, 
you know, it's it, it's 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 giving them the ability to kind of have passive income, right? You you put up your um, project file on scraps. People will go. We have everything categorized by genre. You can kind of see your favorite artist buy the project file. That artist like gets some money out of it. Um, the, the the producer is trying to learn, get some knowledge out of it as well. So we just launched, and uh, right now it's just my project files on there. Love but it. Uh, we're gonna be looking at a bunch of new artists. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I may have to talk to you there because yeah. I have a ton of stuff. I'm not like switching lanes, but I'm definitely I have like a live show that's finally put together and. I have a lot of dubstep shit that I will never put out. Exactly. I will well, never what, put out. We're working on another part of the company to, uh, you know, sell that stuff um, in a more rights transfer way as well. Yeah. I can't speak too much on that yet. but That sounds um, awesome. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's super fun. It's like another thing I get to kind of like work on other than just like Various the Various revenue music. streams. I'm it's important. You, it's important. Diversify. Guys. You got to yeah. diversify. Yeah. But um, yeah, and a uh, ton of shows and some festivals this summer. That I'm super excited about. and uh, Absolutely. Yeah, some more shows in the fall. Sweet. Well, cool. thanks, Tyler, for coming on. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. See you guys. Bye. Just getting about to kill Mission. Slay it. Slay it. So Let's do talking. it. Woo. Cool. That was good. That was good. Yeah.